The Office of Intramural Training and Education has produced a series of videos designed to help those who are interested in transitioning to an industry position. In this segment, we examine how industry trends impact the employment opportunities. My name is Brad Fackler, and I'm the Industry Career Advisor here within OITE. For the purposes of this, we define industry very broadly. We include the pharma, biotech sector, medical device, service providers, and consumable companies, and even including health insurers, venture capital, and government. The reason we do this is because the process that you go through and the, the tools that you need are exactly the same. Let's look at revenue estimates. The pharmaceutical industry is by far the largest sector followed by biotech, medical device, life science tools and reagents, and the contract research organizations. In total, it is about 1.5 trillion US dollars. The sales by region, you can see that about 40% of the sales are in North America, and a little bit less in the European sector, followed by Japan, Europe, and Latin America. This is changing. You can see that the Latin American and Asian markets are growing, while the more established markets of North America, Europe, and Japan tend to be shrinking. This is an industry that relies on research and development. The pharmaceutical sector, you can see the top 10 companies in research and development, and an estimate of about 18 to 20 percent of their revenues are spent in R&D. In total, the pharmaceutical industry spends about $140 billion annually on research and development. Biotech, you see slightly lower dollar amounts, but higher percentages of sales. These tend to be smaller, newer companies. And then in medical device, in total, it's about $200 billion annually spent in research and development, and second only to the electronics industry. Worldwide employment, you can see that in total there's almost 3 million people that work for the pharma and biotech sector. That is just under 5% of the total global population. Now for those of you with your PhD, I'm sure you have read these articles which have come out over the last 10 to 12 years. And we can see that there has been an increase in the number of PhDs awarded in the U.S. This is not just a U.S. issue. The chart on the right shows globally the increase in PhDs issued between 1998 and 2006. And this all stems from the famous article from the National Science Foundation, which said that in 1973, about 55% of those with a science PhD were in an academic tenure track position. More recently, that number is more down around 10 to 12%. It's really impossible to completely separate industry and academia. And you can see in what I've titled the good old days, pre-1990, the way it worked was the government funded the discovery research, the compounds then went to pharma for development and for marketing. In the late 1980s, the government decided they couldn't afford this kind of research. So the academic market looked to the pharma sector to support their initial discovery research. And this worked well for a while, but there became some ethical issues. The pharma companies thought that since they were funding these things, they ought to be able to have a say in how those studies came out. As we got to the 2000s, there was private funding available from the venture capital and they looked at their success in the technology market and said we can be equally successful in the biotechnology market. And that worked until 2007 when our financial slowdown virtually dried up private investing. Going forward, 
figuring this out is going to be critical to our ability to discover and develop new treatments. Between 2007 and 2012, within pharmaceutical and biotech, there were nearly 500,000 job losses. Now to put that number in perspective, that's approximately twice the number of job losses in the U.S. automobile industry. And unlike in past downturns, job losses have been relatively equally divided among marketing, sales, and R&D. When we look for a reason for this, it was a perfect storm of things happening. There had been years of diminishing returns on both R&D and marketing expenditures. There were bloated and inefficient R&D organizations caused by industry consolidation. And rising health care costs, with an increasing percentage of that cost, paid out of pocket by private individuals. And outmoded strategies for product development and marketing. And also what we called the patent cliff. The patent cliff is that between 2013 and 2016, nearly $500 billion in annual sales from products went off patent and began generic competition. When we examine this perfect storm, the economic situation didn't cause these issues, but it exposed an industry model that was broken. Some perspective around that, and that even with the 500,000 job losses, the overall industry employment was down only about 6%. And that means that while companies were laying people off, other companies, mainly the smaller and mid-sized companies, were hiring. And the hiring looks very bright in this sector. When you look at the year-over-year -year sector postings, you see that the current year in red versus the former year in blue. And if you stack all those red bars up, it's about 25 to 30 percent more hiring in this year than in the past. When you look at this across all the sectors in life science, you see two things. You see a general upward trend, and you see the rather roller coaster effect of the seasonal hiring generally highest in the second and third quarters and lowest in the fourth quarter. So as you begin to examine this, there are a number of resources available to you. The My IDP Science Careers is a great online assessment of what jobs are out there and where they are. SciencePhD.com is good as well. We in the OITE Career Center can help you if you make an appointment online. The OITE Careers blog is a great source of information on industry positions. I invite you to view the other industry videos at the OITE YouTube channel, and I wish you much success as you embark on your industry career.